Okay, it's recording now. Uh, so I was uh, saying that uh, this started bang ago in the World War II because they needed to come up with a approach to design the thickness of the runways for their planes. And they uh, came up with the concept of the equivalent single wheel load by comparing the single wheel load with multiple wheels. And uh, there's different way to do this. And uh, basically is uh, based on one criteria such as stress, deflection, strains. So Boyd and Foster in the 1950s uh, came up with the first approach, uh, a little more formal. And uh, they considered vertical stresses uh, on an elastic half space, like what we have seen before in our analysis of stresses and strains. And they identified that the equivalent single wheel low is gonna depend on the thickness of the pavement. So if the pavement is very thin, uh, they encounter a very different situation than if the pavement was thick. So for the thickness uh, that is less than half the clearance between dual tires, there's no overlap of stresses. And the equivalent single wheel load is just one half of the total load. But when the thickness of the pavement is more than half the clearance, then there's overlap. And after a certain point, there's complete overlap that's illustrated there on the right hand side. So they propose this equation, the logarithm of the equivalent single wheel load, this one over here, is equals to the logarithm of the load on one tire uh, plus this factor. This factor is the one that is making the adjustments between one tire and uh, the equivalent single wheel load. And of course, as you can see here on the chart, when the thickness of the pavement is less than D over two, and D is the clearance between the, the dual tires, uh, then you can just consider PD. There will be no effect of this factor. Uh, but when you have more than two times SD, in that case, uh, you have a full overlap of these two uh, dual tires. So, Let's look at an example. Let's have a set of dual tires uh, with 9,000 pounds each. Uh, no, pardon, 9,000 pounds uh, on both of them. So 4,500 pounds each. And the contact radius area is gonna be four and a half inches. And the uh, separation uh, between them is uh, 13 and a half inches. And we're gonna use the equivalent single wheel load uh, uh, to estimate what is the thickness. Um, so, let's see. Oh, okay, actually the answer is coming in the next slide. So I'm just gonna put the next slide. So we have two times, sorry. We have two times uh, the dual tire that is 9,000. So one of them is 4,500. Now the contact area A is four and a half. The separation, is 13.5 inches and uh, my distance so the distance will be uh, from here to here it is 13.5 minus four and a half minus four and a half which is written there so it's only four and a half and the z which is the depth uh, is 13 and a half inches that's the depth of the uh, hot mix asphalt layer so the log, so I'm just using this equation that we have seen before over here. Center to center, you can see it here. 13 and a half is SD, the center to center. And 13 and a half minus this radius minus this radius is the clearance D. Okay, so we're using this equation that we have there. And so we plug in our values. So PD is 4,500, so we put it in here. Then we have two times Z. Z is the depth of this, is 13 and a half. So we put the 13 and a half in there, divided by 4.5. And then on the denominator, we have logarithm of four times SD, SD is 13 and a half, divided by D, D is 
So when you get the entire uh, thing, I can probably put this in Excel. Is there an open microphone that I hear some feedback? Am I the only one hearing that feedback? No. Okay. So we have the log of equivalent single with load. It's going to be the log of 4,500. That's the first term. And then the second term is uh, 301 log of 2 times 13.5. Yes, go ahead with your question. No, there wasn't a question. I see something. Yeah, that's what I was. Um... Okay. Is um... if you guys can mute, not everybody's muted. There's somebody keep sending me a feedback back. Okay. Okay, so let's see, this is the point 301 log. So this is the numerator, fine. Now the denominator is gonna be uh, the log, again, open bracket, four times, SD, my SD is 13.5 divided over 4.5. Uh, so the second factor is the division between these two. And then the total of this is these two amounts. So 387, okay, so that was correct, what is written there. And then uh, to get the equivalent single wheel load, we need to make uh, a 10 to the power of that, the 387. And that is, 4,717 pounds. This is uh, using Foster and Alvin. Okay. Ah, no, Boyd and Foster. Sorry, guys. It was Boyd and Foster. Okay. Uh, so uh, this is the equivalent single wheel load that this uh, pavement um, can withstand, okay? Now, of course, uh, then you go back and uh, you see that what is the thing you have. Now we can uh, do this uh, several times and we can check uh, different depths. So we check 13 and a half inches, right? This is the one we just did and we obtained 7,700 and something. Uh, but we can do it for 2.25 and we can do it for 27 and we can do for multiple of these and you will come across this uh, final result. Uh, in the chart, the 225 goes to four and a half, the 27 goes to nine. And then if you put this in logarithmic scale, you have a direct relationship between the equivalent single wheel low factor and the pavement thickness. Okay, so when you know what is the uh, wheel load of your plane, you can just project back and project here and you have the pavement thickness in inches. There are other ways and we're gonna look at two more ways and we're gonna compare with the same result. One is using the vertical stress factor that we learned before. So we can use this chart that we have used already to determine the equivalent single wheel load Please notice that what we have in the chart is a sigma z divided by q, right? And uh, so uh, this is Bussi's next uh, theory. And uh, the maximum stress under the single wheel load is happening at a point like A, which is on the axis of symmetry. But this is a single wheel. We don't have a single wheel. We have a dual tire. 
Uh, now, if we continue just for one moment uh, for the single wheel at a depth Z uh, in this point A, and we have the radius and we have the load. So you take the radius, you get the area, you divide the load over the area, and that gives you the Q. And with that Q, which is here on the denominator, and the uh, R equals zero, and the radius over the A, and uh, all that, you can go back to the chart and you can obtain uh, the, uh, the sigma C. Now, uh, but as I said, that is for a single. We are interested in a dual. When we have a dual, what is happening is uh, here at the bottom of this figure, you have multiple points where you might have the maximum. You just don't know where it's gonna happen because it depends on the depth. So if you have your uh, load, your PD here, or the dual tire, so you have two points of application really, and you have uh, this distance A. One possible is in the axis of symmetry as we saw before. So point A is the same as point one, but we are now considering the load that is on the right hand side. So we can also consider the point that is halfway between the two of them, and we can consider any point in between one and three. I'm just gonna put two, but you could think of other points, okay? Why we don't consider nothing between three and the axis of symmetry of the second load? Because it's gonna be simply a repetition of what I have between one and three right now. Now, let us imagine, and remember that is sigma C over Q what I have, right? So sigma C is equals to sigma C. I divide and multiply sigma Z on the left by QS, which is the single uh, load uh, distributed. And on the right hand side, instead I do for that the same for the dual. So I have sigma C over Q for the dual tire. Okay. And then uh, based on that, I know that uh, sigma C, so I can send this sigma C over S, this bracket on the left, I can send to divide on the right hand side. And I can send the QD on the other side to divide. So it's gonna be QS divided by QD, and then on the right hand side is gonna be this divided by this. Now the QS and the QD, they have the same area because it's the same load. And so areas and pi's cancel and you end up with the load, the PS and the PD, which is the concentrated on the single and the dual. And we are trying to find the relationship between the single and the dual. So PS is single. You send the dual to the other side. And so the uh, load for the single is equals to this uh, fraction here multiplied by the load on the dual. So this is how you can take whatever you have on the dual and express it as a single, as an equivalent single load. So let's make an example based on that. I'm taking again the same values I had before. I hope you noticed that. I'm taking again, again 4,500, 13 and a half center to center, four and a half radius, okay? But now I'm gonna be testing multiple points. I'm gonna test points one, two, and three. The point one, this one over here, is at a radius of zero because it's on the axis of symmetry. The point three, I talk about point two in a moment. The point three is halfway between these two. If the whole distance center to center is 13 and a half, is half of that. So it's 13 and a half divided by two is 675. That's my point three. And point two is halfway between these two. So it's 675 divided by two, three, three, seven, five. So that's how I get my point number two. Okay. On the right hand side, I have different radius. Why? because now between point one and uh, the axis of symmetry of this, I have the whole 13 and a half. That's what I have there. Between the axis of symmetry of this and point three, I have half of this. So I have 675. And between the axis of symmetry of the load that is on the right hand side and the point two, I have the same as 13.5 minus this distance over here, 3375. Okay, so I have those distances in there, which you have here, right? 
So those distances are 3, 225, 1.5. Question? Okay, so you have those three distances on the right-hand side, you have those three distances on the left-hand side. These are distances divided by A now. So I'm dividing everything by four and a half, all right? And we are gonna bring the chart and we're gonna start working with those distances. So the first one is R over A equals zero and Z over A, let's see what that Z over A is. Z over A is here, is 13.5, which is this depth, divided by the radius, which is four and a half. So it's three. So I'm gonna be constant working at that uh, Z over A. So that's why this three over here is constant, okay? Now I'm gonna go and hit the zero, which is my first R over A. I'm just gonna put my values there, okay? So for R over A zero, let's see how do I make this. Oh, didn't increase. Okay. So I go all the way here and then I hit here and I'm reading, will you guys say 15, maybe? So that's gonna be sigma C divided by Q. We say 15 roughly, I guess. Now the next one is R over A 0.75. My 0.75 is here. So I'm reading something like here and I will be reading something like maybe 12. you probably realize that this is not very accurate because we are reading on a chart and rather we will have an equation. I agree, but I'm just trying to illustrate something here. Okay? And R over A is 1.5. This is my one over here. So this is my 125 and this is my 1.5. So I am reading somewhere like there, a, a little less actually. So I'm reading maybe eight. Okay, we need to move this uh, a little bit to the left. This is not very accurate. This arrow has to be a little to the left, but it's something like 7.5. Now I go and repeat the same for these points on the right-hand side. So let me just copy these two here. And uh, I have three, 2.25 and 1.5. So for three, sorry, I don't want that to happen. I'm just gonna move back. So for three, R over A, my three is here, okay? So I will be reading there, right? So that means that is roughly three. And then for 225, I have my two, 2.5, so it's halfway between those two. I will probably think is uh, about there, right? So I'm reading maybe um, uh, 5.3, something like that, right? And uh, finally, I have 1.5. Oh, but 1.5 was the same I had here, right? You see? So it, it should be the same value. Now, this is sigma C over Q, but I already know what is my Q? Hopefully I do. Because you see, I have 4,500 pounds. That is my P. And I have an area, well, I have a radius, A, which is 4.5. And that means I have an area, contact area, that is equals to pi times the radius squared. So my distributed load is gonna be that. That's gonna be my Q. So now uh, you see how this is um, 
this is my sigma divided by uh, Q. Ah, yes. Uh, this is times 100. Okay, uh, this is not yet times 100. So I'm going to copy the same, but I'm going to make it times 100. So I'm just going to copy here for a moment. And now I'm just going to say whatever is this one divided by 100. And I'm going to do the same for this one. OK, now I'm going to just go a little back here. And you see how this is uh, from the left? It's going to insert. So this is left, the left node. It's not right. Left. And this one is from the right. So you remember we used superposition last time? We're going to. We're going to use superposition again. So uh, this is by superposition, this will be my dual. So it will be this plus this. OK. OK. In the textbook, they have their own values. So I don't know whether you guys preferred me to uh, go back and look at the textbook or make conclusions based on what we have obtained here. In the textbook, uh, in the textbook somehow, they got this as, uh, yeah, it's slightly different of what we have now. Uh, because they have 0.143 and we got 0.15. Is this the inaccuracy when we are reading? 0.03, that's correct. 0.053, that's correct. 0.12, they got 0.126. I don't know how they're reading three decimals. And we got 0.075, they got 0.088. This is what is published on the book, okay? So if we look at the book, the maximum will be the 0.79. If we look at ours, it's actually here on the first one which is on the axis of symmetry, right? But for the book, this one is a slightly higher. Um, so you will take the highest of them, which in our case will be this one, okay? And then the corresponding for the single will be this. That's the highest, right? Yes. So this is, uh, this is single. Ah, I believe it, sorry guys. And that's dual. Uh, so the maximum stress uh, for the book is simply the relationship between the single, uh, the dual and the single multiplied by the load, right? So uh, the equivalent single wheel load is equals to the uh, P for the single. And that is uh, the value of the dual divided by the value of the single, and that is multiplied by the actual load that we have. And the load we have is 4,500, so it's gonna be 5,400. In the book, they got 5,630. Um, I, it's because of the inaccuracy when we're reading on the chart, but I hope you understand what is the approach. There is an improved uh, method from Foster and Alvin from 58. And uh, they also look at a similar approach, but they use the deflections instead. So if you remember before, we did the dual over the single multiplied by the load. They're doing the same, but instead of using the uh, relationship uh, between the loads, they are using the relationship from the F factor the F factor that you read from this chart, okay? So we're using this chart actually to get our values. So if we repeat the same and repeat the same points that we did before, so we're doing the same thing, except that we're not doing it with the stress, we're doing it with these deflections, okay? So we're using a different chart. 
So we have the same uh, load, the same configuration, the same distances, uh, clearance, and we have the same points. So we have exactly the same thing. But now we're gonna do it with that other chart. So let me just copy this. Actually, I'm just gonna copy this. So this is based on stress. And this one that is coming now is gonna be based on deflections. Okay, so we're gonna have to estimate the same, but instead of sigma uh, C over Q, we will be estimating our F values. So it's gonna be our F values, which we don't know what they are. Okay, and of course, this one is from the left. I'm just gonna put it here, okay? This is for the left, and this is for the right. Okay, and we have the same R over A, and we have the same um, uh, Z over A, which is three. So we go with the three, and we go and read for the first one, which is zero. So zero is here. And with the zero, we are reading up here uh, 0.48 maybe. We go to the 0.75, which is this curve over here. And we read maybe 0.45. And we go with the one and a half, which is this curve over here. And we read maybe 0.39. We go with the other values of three. Value of three is here, right? So we read, uh, this is 0.25 here, so this is 0.3. So this is like 0.27 maybe. Uh, let me see, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.26, 0 0.27. 2.25. Uh, 2.25 is probably somewhere about there. You see, this is two, this is two and a half. So that will be 0 0.3, this point four. So 0 0.32. If you are not sure, it's better you use a slightly bigger, that will be on the safe side. And 1.5 is this curve over here. Uh, that one, right? So this will be 0.39. Oh, okay, it's here already. We already did it. Okay, so we have exactly the same with the same points. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, let me just go back there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy and replace values. Well, you know what? I can actually do it right here. So let's put here the dual. So the dual will be this plus this. And apparently the last one, which is uh, mid, midway, midpoint, halfway through, is the highest in this case, right? I don't know, I, I will show you the textbook in a moment. And that is the highest for the single, right? None of this is higher. If one of these, for instance, were 0.5, then we will select it, but this is the highest from the single, right? These are singles, all these. And our dual is there, that's the highest. In the case of the textbook, uh, the highest is also the last one for dual. And the highest for single is also the first. So in this case, uh, I'm almost getting the same values of the textbook, very close. Uh, again, I don't know how the textbook is doing to get three decimals. That seems impossible. Yes, no jump. Uh, sir, I have a question. Uh, in, in the outline, I think uh, we're supposed to uh, cover the analysis traffic loading uh, in this session and after that airport was for the next session. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay, then I invert it. Uh, because 
Just no, for sure. Just uh, from my curiosity, I ask. Yes, my mistake. I thought that, I thought that these are uh, connected to each other. Um, Somehow. Oh uh, yeah, because some some terminologies was really new to me and I couldn't understand that. So terminology thought, from here. Yeah, the the idea. I think. I thought. Uh, that, yeah. Uh, no, it's simply the idea of the equivalent single wheel load because there are three ways you can do this. One is uh, bringing all the vehicles uh, mm. to a standard axle. The mm. other one is bringing all the loads into an equivalent single load. And mm. the other one is considering every single axle load separately. Uh, so uh. Uh, the airport is based on the single wheel load while mm -hmm. for highways is based on the equivalent axle and uh -huh. the US for highways is based on all the vehicles and trucks. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have done it sometimes, this one first and the other one after or the other way around. It shouldn't be a big difference. Oh, okay. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Uh, so uh, see, you see now the dual, the maximum is this and the single, the maximum is this. So uh, based in the approach, my uh, equivalent single wheel load, because I have a dual tire configuration really, right? But is, I have something on the left and something on the right. So it's gonna be the relationship between the dual, the maximum, and the single maximum. And uh, that's an expansion factor that is gonna multiply the actual load that I have in one of them. And I will multiply this plus this. So in this case, it's 7,312 pounds, right? If you remember, Boyd and Foster was 7,417 pounds. 7,300 is not that, that far off. It's a much better approximation to that. What happened if I have in these thicknesses, I don't have 13 and a half. What happened if my thickness is much less? when in some points, the much less will mean that the contribution will only require one single wheel, and then you don't have to estimate this factor. You just read directly from the 4,500. So this factor is only considering this uh, stress, uh, well, in this case, deflection, to make the adjustment from the single, this is my single uh, load, my single ax, my single uh, uh, load, and I'm just expanding the value of that single load uh, to go and, and, and become an equivalent single load, equivalent from the dual tire, from the dual axle. Uh, there is uh, one more approach that Juan in 68 uh, came with. Juan is the author of the, one of the textbooks that is on the course outline. And uh, he was criticizing the previous because uh, the assumption of homogeneity is not uh, logical. So he came up with a series of charts like this one. Okay, so two people have raised hands. Where are you? Professor. Yes. Uh, you divided uh, dual maximum with single maximum. So for all the scenarios, Boyd and Foster, so we do that same thing? No. You do it for the stress and for the deflection. Boyd and Forster has their own equation. Okay, okay. Right? Okay, oh, thank you. Uh, somebody else, right hand. Somebody else? I saw two people with questions. Maybe it was the same question. Okay. Uh, so I was saying that um, one came up with these charts, and in these charts, you have the pavement thickness on the x axis, and you have the total load divided by the equivalent single wheel load and uh, to enter on the y. And then here you have the relationship between the uh, elastic modulus of the two layers. This is for a two layer system. And so uh, you enter with the ratio of loads, and then you hit the uh, the ratio of elastic modulus, and then you read the thickness of the paper. So, for instance, you have two layers, and one layer the is uh, the asphalt is ten times stronger than the subgrade soil. So, e one over e two is ten. 
the, the spacing between the wheels is 48 inches and the contact radius is 16 inches. And if my total load is uh, 9,000 pounds divided in two points of application, uh, I will go with the total load, that is 9,000, divided by the equivalent single wheel load. So now you have three candidates to choose values from, right? We had the deflection, uh, which is 7,312, 7,312. 7, you have this uh, Boyd and Foster, 7,417. And then you have this uh, stress approach. So probably you will go with either this or this. In this example here, I'm going with uh, this, uh, which is coming from one of those. Uh, it gives me a ratio of 122 to enter here. And because I'm using this wheel spacing and this area, I enter here, I hit the 10, I read down, and I need a pavement of 25 inches. So this is how you design in the old days. And this is so you can see that the concept is also tied to uh, the stress and strains analysis and deflection that we have covered before. However, I will cover a method that already has charts that will give you uh, the values of the thickness for the asphalt, cement, or the concrete layers, and for the granular layer, uh, without the need to go through all this analysis. So to avoid going through this analysis, that method is basically going to use the, uh, the wheel load. And so it's going to create groups for the planes. And uh, it's going to simplify a bit things. The method is from 92, no, Jan? Yes, sir. Uh, how we can uh, basically choose the material of this basically uh, layer after we found out what is the thickness? Uh, because you know what is the elastic modulus. So with the elastic modulus, you know what material you have. Mm -hmm. So if your elastic modulus is uh, 350,000 and it's asphalt cement and your subgrade soil is uh, 35,000, you have a ratio of 10, but right there you already know the material. Okay. If you have a, a Portland cement of uh, 500,000 and you have a, a subgrade soil of 5,000, then this is gonna be five, um, this is gonna be 100. So you will read here in the curve for 100. Uh, so when you are doing this ratio, you're already selecting what material you use for the top layer. Okay? Yes, thanks. Okay. So the method is from 92 and is from Transport Cana. Uh, is using the aircraft load ratings. So instead of the need to establish this equivalent single wheel load, we use the weights for classified planes. I'll show you the table in a moment. And it has some associated uh, materials and manuals, the ASG06 for the construction and testing. And uh, it has uh, multiple tables and info. I'm going to show some of that info. Uh, it, it has as main component, because it's for Canada, the uh, freezing index. And this is the main component you use for this uh, method. You will see why very soon. Uh, the pavement structure is designed for frost protection. And uh, this is because in Canada, most of the pavements will suffer from uh, subgrade frost. And that is, of course, the case unless the subgrade soil is gravel and sand, um, and then it's not frost susceptible. The air freezing index, mass, uh, you can obtain that from Environment Canada or the climatic station uh, that is nearby your pavement. Now, this is the reason why we use the freezing index. If you see this line or this chart, you enter this with your freezing index, okay? And with the freezing index, you hit the line and then you read the minimum thickness of the pavement structure. And this is the entire pavement structure. So that means it is the top layer, which could be concrete or asphalt, and the granular layers. So it's everything. Whenever the freezing index has more freezing index days, then you require thicker pavements. That is because under 2000, 
freezing days, you have a much higher probability that the subgrade soil will freeze. And when it freezes, it expands, and when it expands, will create cracks and destroy your pavement. When the freezing index is smaller, then in that case, the number of uh, freezing days is less, and so the damage on the pavement, and so you need uh, less, uh, you, need, you can use a thinner pavement. You have this equation, so any value that is beyond 2,000, let's say 2,500, as we actually have in Canada, you will put it here instead of this F, and you will use this equation to obtain the value of T. Now, that's the entire pavement structure. Uh, the method also gives you some minimum thickness for some uh, uh, of the vehicles, uh, for the aprons and the service roads that you use on the uh, airport to move the cargo and move the, uh, the, the freight. Uh, but we're not going to look into this one. I just want you to know that it's there. So we will be selecting uh, from different alternatives and the main two are the asphalt concrete or the Portland cement. And um, if the tire pressure is more than one megapascal, you have to use Portland cement. You have no choice. If it is less, then you can use asphalt. How do you know? Because there is a table and in that table, you will have the group of airplanes. And each group of airplanes will tell you what is the tire pressure. So you will know that I think is for groups uh, 11, 10, 11, and 12, you have more than one. So for those groups, you have to do it as uh, Portland cement. And for groups uh, 1 to 8 or 1 to 9, we will see soon and confirm, you can use asphalt. The depth of the flexible pavement is always equals to the greater of the frost protection or the structural thickness. And at the top of the base course, you have to apply a prime coat. A prime coat is a liquid uh, asphalt binder that will seal and will also provide a good bonding between the uh, base, the granular materials that are compacted already, and the asphalt layer that comes on top. Uh, for a concrete pavement, we will have sub-base, base, and the asphalt surface. Uh, and the granular surface uh, uh, pavements are only based on uh, sub-base and base, and the base cannot go beyond 15 centimeters. These granular surface pavements are used in very rural areas where we don't have uh, a lot of uh, planes coming. We just have a few. And so uh, it is not uh, warrant to spend the money to have a paid runway, uh, but we do provide a structure. So how do we do the rigid pavement design? So you will go and uh, you will uh, run through this uh, four step process. The first slab thickness, the, the, the top layer, the thickness will come from figure 342. Uh, in this one, you will enter always with a first approximation uh, using a K value of 75 megapascals per meter. This is a bearing modulus of the surface. It's not the subgrade soil bearing modulus. Then you go to step two, and uh, the thickness of the base plus the sub-base, so all the granular thickness is coming from the total frost protection thickness, T, that we saw in the previous chart, uh, minus the top layer. And uh, it has to have a minimum of 15 centimeters. Step three, you take the bearing capacity, uh, K, according to figure 323. For that one, you need to enter with two inputs. The subgrade soil capacity, and the equivalent granular uh, layers, which is again the difference between the T, the total thickness, minus the uh, slab. So you already have that. And step four, uh, with the bearing modulus that you estimate before the, the, for the surface, uh, you go and you go back to step one. And instead of 75, now you enter with this new value. And that is your second iteration. 
And for that second iteration, you run again through steps two and three, arrive again to step four. And then if the difference between this second time that you do step four and the previous time you did step four is very little, and very little I mean in the order of one centimeter or less, then you don't continue, you stop there. The thickness of the Portland cement concrete slab cannot be less than 23 centimeters. And the thickness of the base granular uh, coarse materials, it cannot be less than 15 centimeters. So these are the groups uh, of uh, planes from five to 12. And this is the chart that we use to estimate the thickness of the concrete slab, sorry. The planes are this. So I'm, I'm going to go back to the previous slides for you. Just have them there. <clears throat> so this is my uh, planes. You might recognize here the B747, maybe. The B727, maybe. The Airbus A300, the B707, the B747-100, okay? The B707-120. Uh, so you will see all this. Now, remember I said that whenever the tire pressure is more than one, uh, so uh, group eight goes between 0.7 and one, and group nine and on is greater than one. So group nine, 10, 11, and 12, you have no choice but to design uh, rigid concrete for the uh, top layer, for the slab, is concrete, Portland cement. If you have uh, the design for an airport that receives planes only, the maximum plane, the heaviest uh, is on group one to eight, then you can do asphalt. As the design. So once you know the uh, airplane type, you know what group, <clears throat> excuse me, you know what group they belong to, and so you know what curve you need to read. The bearing modulus is the 75 for the first iteration, so you go with 75 on the first iteration, hit the plane group, and then read the concrete slab thickness here. On the second iteration, you enter with whatever value you have estimated based on the total granular thickness and the subgrade soil capacity. Um, oh yes, this is when do you require frost protection. Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, let's, I will expect you guys to have a read on this. Um, I don't see the point for me to really read this. Okay, go ahead, Ali. Ali, you are muted probably. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Is frost protection is done only by the temperature or it is related to the soil material as well? Uh, it's related to soil material. So if the soil material, um, Depending on the type of soil material, the, some is more uh, has more propensity for freezing. Mm -hmm. It means that, uh, for example, uh, clay is more sensitive uh, by frost protection. Yeah, clay can be more sensitive. Is the type of soil that will hold water. So if your soil is uh, very porous and get rid of the water very easily, uh, mm -hmm. then it's not gonna be frost susceptible. But if your soil holds water like clay does, then it might be more susceptible, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so we will enter always into this chart and estimate always the total thickness of the pavement. And from this chart, we will enter and estimate the slab. The difference between this total thickness in this chart minus the concrete slab is going to be your base layer. Okay, so we will always be playing with these two charts. The rigid pavement bearing modulus K is estimated from the figure 3 to 3, which I'll show you in a moment. And this is based on the granular layers and the subgrade soil. It has a limiting value of 135. So let's see what I'm talking about. You go and you do some soil testing in the lab 
And you estimate that your subgrade uh, soil bearing strength is uh, 100, let's say. And then, because you did here the total thickness, right? Minus the slab thickness, you know how much is your granular thickness. And because you know how much is your granular thickness, then you can take the 100, come up here, hit the granular thickness, let's imagine it's 40, and then you can go and read here your surface bearing modulus of about 83. And then you go back here and, uh, no, sorry. You will go back here and you will enter with the new K value for the surface. Okay? Now, if you have an old pavement that is in place, you can trans, and you are going to keep that pavement, but you will only use that pavement as a foundation then you can transform that foundation into an equivalent granular thickness by using some factors that I will show you later. Let's forget about that for a moment and imagine we're doing a brand new design. In that case, the equivalent granular thickness base and subbase is just the base and subbase because you don't have any pre-existing structure. Here are some typical uh, subgrade bearing strength recommended by Transport Cana, depending on uh, the subgrade soil type. And uh, this is the range of values for subgrade bearing strength. So if you have uh, poorly graded sand, you are looking somewhere between 110 and 135. If you have clay with low liquid limit, you have somewhere between 65 and 85 and so on, of course. There is no replacement for a geotechnical report, but if you don't have it and you have to do a, a conceptual preliminary design or, or you have to do the design and, and, and have some preliminary results uh, and recommend so that you can move from there. Sometimes even with the preliminary, you can establish the feasibility. Uh, so you can use something like this with the warnings that this is for a preliminary design. Now, remember I told you, that if we have a pre-existing structure, then we will convert it into an equivalent granular thickness. To do that conversion, we will be looking into these conversion factors. So, of course, if you have granular base, uh, gravel, stone base, you pulverize your previous concrete, then you're looking at one. If you have cement stabilized base, you're looking at two. If you have an old asphalt concrete, you're looking at one and a half. If you have an existing asphalt concrete that is in good condition, but for and uh, the uh, capacity is not any more sufficient, and now you have to go for Portland cement, you can put a Portland cement on top of an asphalt concrete. You will multiply by two the thickness of your asphalt cement layer, and that will give you your equivalent thickness. So for instance, imagine you have an asphalt concrete of 40 centimeters, and it's in good condition. You multiply 40 by two and you get 80. That 80 will be your equivalent here in this chart. Okay. Ah, there's an example there. Okay. Um, okay, let's do an example. So uh, let's imagine we're in Halifax. And let's assume in Halifax we have 200 uh, increasing day index, so uh, 200 days. Celsius day. And the design aircraft is a B707-120. Let's imagine we have silt with high liquid limit. So we have the silt with high liquid limit. It has a design value between 20 and 40. So we can use 30 maybe as midpoint between those two values. This B707-120 will correspond to a specific plane. Uh, where is that plane? B707-120. Ah, here it is. It was moved, the chart, guys. I don't know if that's the case in the one you downloaded from Moodle. But it's group 10, okay? The plane group is 10. So this arrow got chipped. It's here. 
So plan group 10. Plan group 10, this one, and I always enter with 75. So I go with 75, hit the plan group 10, and right there, right here, right now, I need 31 centimeters for the concrete slab. So I go for the first iteration. Concrete slab, we say 31, right? Centimeters. And my total pavement. So remember, I have uh, 200. What am I? Here, 200 freezing days. So I have 200, I go up here and I read, what is it, 52 maybe? And I make the difference between 52 minus 31. So this is my granular base in centimeters. I go now into my second iteration. For the second iteration, I have to go here. Now, if you remember, we said we have 30. We say we have 30 for the subgrade soil, okay? With those 30, I will go here. I think I might have the chart down here, but it looks like all the arrows got moved. And I have a thickness of 52, right? So this is 50. So I'm reading here, sorry guys, you need to ignore whatever is on the presentation because typically students start asking for different scenarios and I start moving this thing around. Uh, so this is 50. And so I am reading uh, 28, shall we say? As the surface K, 28. So, um, my surface, okay, K surface, I say what? 28. And this is not default value anymore. So, I come back here and I enter now with 28, right? And I have to hit group 10. So that's my group 10. And that means, okay, I have uh, maybe 36 approximately. This is my uh, concrete slab, 36. So my concrete slab is 36 centimeters. My total pavement, does it change? Can somebody tell me? Does the total pavement thickness change or is the same? It's the same. Yes, it is the same, that's correct. And the granular is the difference between those two. My granular is now 16 centimeters. That's the end of my second iteration. I go for my third iteration. Well, let's see if I have to go for my third iteration. You see how it's five centimeters here and five centimeters here. So yes, I have to go for my third iteration. So my uh, granular is now 16. So I go now again to my granular chart. I'm gonna maybe try to stretch this and increase the size a little bit. And the subgrade soil is 30. So this is 50, this is 25, and 30 is probably somewhere in here. And I'm reading 16. So I'm basically reading less than here. So I'm reading here directly. So I'm reading 20, which is the minimum. 
already. Okay. Uh, so at least that's good news. We don't have to do any other iteration after this. Uh, that means my uh, surface modulus is 20. So my k surface is 20. Uh, not 20, not 10, 20. And the concrete slab Yeah, so the concrete slab, I'm entering here with 20. Oh, ha <laughs> at the minimum. And I'm reading group 10. So I am reading 37 maybe? And my total pavement is the same. And my uh, granular is the difference between those two which is gonna be almost the same as before. We had some minimums that we talk about, but let's recall the minimums, where are they? Here. So we say the thickness of the Portland cement shall be no less than 23. I have 37, okay, so that's fine. And the thickness of the base shall not be less than 15. Well, it's 15. So we're in the minimum. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, ask. Uh, two participants. Yes. I, I cannot see your names, guys, so go ahead. Three, okay. Go. Tell me. Sorry, guys, okay, then I have to look at your names. Um, Anna. Yes, Professor. Uh, I wanted to ask when uh, you were looking for the uh, total pavement and or granule base in the uh, chart. Here? It was um, the chart in 40 something slide. Uh, oh yeah, 45. This yes. one? Uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, 48. This one? Yes, thank you. Uh, when we don't have the exact amount uh, for the, uh, yes, between you those. Interpolate. Yeah, I didn't get how you read when we don't have the exact amount. Oh, because see, the 10 is hitting here. The 10 is hitting already at uh, 37 or something like that. Okay. And the 20 is hitting here. So it's hitting like at 32, 33. But I had less than that. So I, I cannot go. Okay, so this is two questions. Let's imagine that I have 65, just for the sake okay. of the example. Then you read in between those two curves. So you go halfway and then you read here. Oh, yes. But in this case, we had, what was it, 16, you see? Yes, yes. We had a 16. So the 16 will be in between these two. In between those two will hit here, where I have my pointer, or I can put the arrow if you wish. Oh, yes. But the bearing, capacity of my subgrid was 30. And I don't think this is 30. This is halfway almost between 25 and 50. Yes. So that will be 50 minus 25 divided by two plus, oops, something. I, I had a different amount before. 50 minus 25 divided by two plus 25. That's like 37, but I have 30. So I, I this arrow doesn't start going up. Is, mm -hmm. is it can, is on the minimum already. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Let's see who else, uh, Ali? Me. Uh, uh, I have a question. Where we consider the effect of uh, the traffic of the airport in this method? No, you don't. You are considering the heaviest loaded plane. Uh-huh, okay. We know that the, uh, uh, our design aircraft is, for example, 707. Well, because your pavement is as strong as it needs to be so that all the stresses and strains will remain within the elastical range. Okay, and the number of uh, landing and takeoff of uh, this design airplane is not important in this method. A plane land? it stress the pavement up to a point that remains within Hooke's law. A plane take uh -huh. off, again, within the elastic range. It doesn't even approach the plastic one. The problem is, 
uh, this is the, the approach based on the weight of the plane, right? Uh, of yes. the heaviest plane using mm -hmm. the airport. And this is not based on the total weight. It's based on the total weight transfer uh, by the by a equivalent single wheel load. Uh, so you might have a plane that is not as big but goes very heavy, and that might be the plane that is uh, uh, the one that is giving all these stresses, and might even go beyond the the range. Uh, it'd be interesting uh, for the final project. I think, uh, I don't know, maybe there's a group already doing another design uh, for airports. Uh, you have the Federal uh, Aviation Administration. Yes. Uh, it's FAA Airfield. Something like this. Uh, Airfield. Airfield. Not airfield, yeah. F-A-A-R field. Ah, that's what I had before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it'd be interesting if somebody uh, takes this and, and then prepares some analysis to see if the number of takeoffs and landings matter or if it is only the, uh, the, the type of plane or if it is the weight on the plane and how this compares with the with the one we're looking now. Uh, I think you can download it and it's free somewhere in here is download. Uh, but this one we're looking at doesn't consider that. Yeah, I think in FAA method, the combination of the, the aircraft in the in uh, airport is important, not an individual uh, design aircraft. Okay, is your team doing that uh, project? No. Uh, no, not currently, but before, before this class, I had the experience of designing for uh, airports. Okay. I think somebody else might be doing it because somebody told me. I can't remember who. All right. There was a whole oh, more hands. Okay, fine. Uh, Nojan? Yes, Professor. My question is about uh, how did you uh, basically come with the... Uh, the number uh, that you said based on the table 30, which is between 20 and 40, is the design values between fall and spring. It's a really simple average that you did. Well, you don't yeah. have any other information. You tell me what would you do. Uh, you can go with 20 if you want. Mm -hmm. Now, just I'm asking what is the rational way to, to deal with this uh, basically condition? Well, you have, you have different seasons of the year, right? Mm -hmm. And when the season of the year is uh, summer and is dry and you don't have uh, much moisture or precipitation, then the sub-grade soil bearing capacity increase. When you have winter, it's frozen and increase whoa, a lot. The problem is when you have a spring or fall mm -hmm. during that season, because of the water that you have in there, the bearing capacity drops. So fall and spring are the worst. And you have here spring 20, fall 40. Mm -hmm. So we have to take a value. You can go for, if you go for 40, maybe you are neglecting the fact that you have a spring with 20, but spring doesn't last the entire year. The spring mm -hmm. only lasts for a few months at most. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's less than, than that. Depends where you are in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I took a simple average just for the example now, but if you want to know how to do it, then I will advise uh, you wait for the ASHTO. And there are ways to make a weighted average between those two, uh, between the entire season of the year, and then obtain an average that depends on the amount of damage that you expect on the pavement based on the bearing capacity of the subject soil. For now, for simplicity, because we have not learned how to do that, then I'm doing a simple average. Ah, okay, thanks a lot, sir. Okay. Any questions regarding the example? Well, it, it appears to me the example is clear then. It's not difficult, you see? It's easy. Let's make maybe a couple more examples. Okay, I had selected Calgary for the second example, but I'm open to any other location, guys. So if you want a different location, tell me now.
All right, apparently not. So this is example one. I'm just gonna copy example one and change the values for example two. Just gonna clear this. Notice I always go with 75. So I'm keeping the 75 there because that is uh, by default the value you use at the beginning. Now we have Calgary with uh, 1000 and uh, with the 1000, I go ahead and read from the frost protection chart 80 centimeters. So I know my total pavement structure is 80 centimeters. Um, I think I have a tweak here, yeah. I'm saying I have an existent uh, layer in place, okay? So we have, uh, it's not here on the, where is the example? No, I don't define it there. Okay, so it's missing here, but I'm saying we have an existing pavement. And I have an existing pavement that is uh, Portland cement in good condition. No, this probably got moved. Okay, no, I'm using this. Okay, but the Portland cement doesn't make much sense for this. Uh, let's implement maybe an asphalt concrete in two. And let's change this example here so that it's four. And uh, maybe that has uh, some base below of 48. And so I will have some thickness there, 112. I go there and my granular will be read here at 112 roughly. But I need to know what is the bearing capacity of my subgrade soil. So what do you want to use for subgrade soil? Guys, if you don't make any suggestions, then I make one myself. Would you guys be happy if I use maybe uh, um, maybe 50? If that is the case, I will come here. And I can read there. And I also have this one. I have to enter this with 75. And oh, what plane? Ah, this is why, because I say assume the same design. So we're not with 50. Do uh, you guys want me to go back to the same design? It doesn't have much value. So I'm gonna say, um, I'm just gonna keep it for this. And I'm gonna say plain group 11, maybe. So I'm gonna go for my plane group 11, which is here. And that is here. So I'm reading 30, 35. So concrete slab is 35 and granular base. Well, that will be 80 minus 35. For the second K, I go into figure three to three, and I am reading uh, 50 and 112. So I'm reading 100 and maybe 111, 112. With 111, and plane group 11, 
this is the contrary, right? I have a, because I have a pre-existing pavement, is bringing down the thickness of the one I'm designing. Uh, so I read maybe 32. Total pavement is the same. And the uh, granular is the difference is 48. So it changed a bit, not that much. Let's try one more time. So I'll go to my second iteration, my surface, K surface. So I have a total, uh, It's not gonna change much, really. You guys want another iteration or you are happy with that one? Because see, you already have a pre-existing pavement here. So this is not gonna change because you have already You have a pre-existing runway user foundation. So this is not gonna change. Although I know I have here granular 48 and 45, that is what is required, but you already have 116. So you have more than required. The concrete slab is what you are gonna pour on top of that. That one might change. So your K value here is gonna be one, one, one again. And the meaning of that is, that nothing is gonna change because this is not gonna move and you are gonna read exactly the same you had before. The total pavement is not changing because that is the requirement. This is requirement by frost protection. And the granular that you require is exactly the same. But the real granular Okay, I'm gonna just say previous, I hope you understand. You already have 112 an equivalent granular thickness. Is this clear? Right so hand. Granular is, granular is uh, both uh, base and sub base or in, uh, only base uh, layer? Base and sub base. Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, I didn't raise hand again. I don't know. Maybe it's. You didn't there. lower your hand then. I oh, think okay. I just did it for you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Nojan? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not sure that about understanding one point. Um, when you mentioned before that we can, uh, if we want to keep the existing uh, layer as the base for the rest of the story, so we have to use some um, basically factors, the correction factors. Did you, you have an existing runway? You already mm -hmm. have a pavement, but maybe that pavement is not enough. So yes, it's not a correction factor. It's a granular equivalency because oh, you will. You can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. You go and you put a concrete, Portland cement concrete slab on top of the existing pavement. Before you do mm -hmm. that, you need to check what is the thickness of that concrete, uh, of that mm -hmm. top layer for the concrete slab. But the granular, you need to make sure that the equivalency of what you have is sufficient for what you need. So this one you have here is what you need, not what you have, you see? Mm -hmm. And this one here is what you need, not what you have you actually have already 112 equivalency, so you're good to go. The problem will be if the equivalency of that is not sufficient for what you need. Exactly, thanks a lot. Yeah. And uh, how did you just uh, uh, basically um, convert it to the, uh, what uh, we have? Oh yes, uh, we look at this. So uh, let me just make this a little bigger. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, the case will be uh, 
I forget about the circles, but you look at the material you have and whether it's in good or fair or poor condition. So maybe you have an, an existing Portland cement concrete, but maybe the thickness is not sufficient. And mm -hmm. maybe it's in poor condition. Mm -hmm. In that case, you have two choices, right? If mm -hmm. it is very, 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 very bad, you mm -hmm. probably pulverize that. Uh, but if you pulverize that, you go into crush gravel or stone base. Mm -hmm. If you keep it, and it's not that good, but you keep it, and maybe you seal it a little bit, and you do something to, 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 to hold it, mm -hmm. uh, then you can imagine that that is as a, a foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you multiply the thickness by two. Okay. If you have a Portland cement concrete in fair condition, you multiply by two and a half. If you have a Portland cement concrete already in good condition, you multiply by three. Now you're gonna wonder, why would I ever put another layer of cement concrete on top of an existing one? Exactly. Maybe, because when you design for that, you were designing for a plain group uh, that was lower than the one you uh, need now. So maybe you did the design for plain group nine, the airport has expanded the wrong way, and now you need 12. And so the thickness is not enough. And uh, then you have the other cases. You have the other cases where you have uh, asphalt, which mm -hmm. is most common. This is the most common case. And then the asphalt, if it is good, times two. If it is poor, times one and a half. If you go to Mexico airport, they had an old asphalt. And on top, they put a new asphalt and on top they put a Portland cement, then got old, then they expanded, and then they had to put another Portland cement. And below all that, they had a, uh, some gravel or something. So you have to do the gravel, you have to do the asphalt, you have to do the Portland cement you had, and then you have to design for the thickness of whatever you need now. Mm -hmm. And compare that, that what we have uh, to what we need. If there is satisfying, so we will keep it. If not, we have to add also the uh complete the existing oh yes layer. of course right if you go and you check the design for what you need and the design is telling you let's assume these values are correct and the design mm -hmm. is telling you i need 48 granular and 32 concrete but you already have 35 concrete and 50 granular nothing to do mm -hmm. you do nothing what you have is sufficient exactly you go and you check and and you need uh more concrete then you have no choice but to put a, an overlay on top. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, is there anybody else with questions? Okay, apparently not. Uh, so guys, um, I had some examples here, but I always change and shift the examples. So. I hope you are clearing this because whatever you see on the charts on the examples is because I was playing with values to answer questions of students before, and then that's the lecture that goes up online. But uh, sometimes the values that I'm uh, pointing out here are misleading to whatever is the text because as you see, I changed it. Like here, it's not gonna match what we have now. Probably. Now, flexible pavements, and we said, we can do a flexible pavement whenever the plane group is from one to eight, okay? Now, if that is the case, we go directly in the design with the subgrade soil uh, capacity. We don't have to use this uh, K surface trick. So this is gone. And so that means we don't have to go to iterations. Whatever is the thickness we obtain, that's the thickness we use. The depth of the flexible pavement is provided by whichever is the greater of these two, the frost protection that is gonna be given soon, or the structural thickness, which is gonna be given soon as well. Uh, for pavements that are surfaced with asphalt concrete, the depth of the pavement structure is divided in layers of asphalt concrete base, and subbase, and you have some minimum layer thickness also. For granular surface pavements, the depth of the pavement shall be divided into base and subbase. We already talked about this, and that is 15 centimeters. 
and the quality of the materials needs to be controlled. I show you something about quality of materials soon. Now, this is figure 341. We say here the structural thickness given by figure 341, okay? We are gonna compare that with the frost protection. So this is the structural thickness. You enter with the subgrade bearing capacity, subgrade soil bearing capacity. And you have also uh, your, um, your plane groups. Uh, you should not be going up to the 12 because as you saw, it's not recommendable that you use up to 12. I don't know why they have it here on the chart. It shouldn't be. And then of course, if you have a brain capacity here, you go up, hit the group uh, for the plane uh, that you need, and then you read the thickness. Now, notice the thickness is starting 20 already and grow pretty fast. Right here, I'm on 100 centimeters. That's one meter of asphalt. So uh, let us uh, work out maybe one or two examples. Uh, I think I put on purpose the aircraft group 10 just to see what is the thickness of this. So if, uh, oh, and uh, I'm working with a bearing capacity that is 30. So this is like the first example we had before, okay? So I'm just gonna take this for a moment. Ah, it's here, sorry. So 30 and plane group 10, will go into 185 or 180 something centimeters. Do you see the problem? Because I went beyond the group plane that is the maximum. The maximum again should be nine. You should not use flexible for plane group 10. And even if I go to nine, because of the poor bearing capacity of the subgrade soil, still I am using 160 and this is the structural thickness, this is not even the frost protection. Now, what is, uh, uh, we need the location, right? If we just use the locations we had before, uh, we will be using the chart for frost protection. I don't see it. So I'm just going to jump into it. So let's imagine we're in Calgary again, and we have 1,000. So that means I have 1,000 here. I had a requirement for frost protection of 80 centimeters. So that means 80 for frost protection and 100 and, what was it? 160, if I am in plane group nine, for structural strength. And this one is saying you use the greater between 80 and 160. So you use 160. Now, if I go into a different location, Calgary, I think we say 500, then my frost protection is gonna be less, is gonna still govern the thickness because now it's something like 67 or 68, and uh, the structural thickness is still 160. If I change, and I change the subgrade soil K, which is my main issue, then I might get different values. So let's go ahead and change that subgrade soil. So let's imagine that we're still in Calgary. So you know that by frost protection, you need 80 centimeters total pavement thickness. And let's imagine that my subgrade soil is 80, not 30 anymore. Oh, and I have the plane group is, let's say, five. So in that case, 
my plane group of five and my, I say 80, right? Yes. And my 80 kilonewtons. Oh, I had the other arrow there. I didn't see it. So I need about 30. And I need 80, these are centimeters. For frost protection. So which one do you use? 80. You use the 80, okay? So this is a contrary case where the frost protection is gonna govern. So this is why it's important uh, to follow this uh, consideration. It's either the highest of these two. But do you see how a poor capacity soil is really going to increase your requirement? And uh, so the main two factors, as you can see, the bearing capacity of the subgrid and the uh, freezing index. And of course, we have a third one that is the plane group, which has to be from one to nine, cannot go beyond that point. Ah, yes, of course. And then I can also have the same situation that I had before, uh, which is, that I have an existent pavement, and let's say that pavement is 20 centimeters hard mix asphalt plus uh, 30 centimeters granular. Okay, let's imagine I'm still in, um, I'm still in Calgary, and I still require a frost protection of 80. Let's imagine my plane group is seven, and let's imagine my subgrade soil is 70. Okay. So, the plane group seven and the subgrade soil is 70. Okay, I go there and my pavement equivalent granular thickness is 60, maybe slightly above 60, tiny notch above 60, maybe 62. I have an existing pavement, right? And that existing pavement is 20 hot mix asphalt plus 30 granular. Now, this is structural requirement is pavement equivalent granular thickness. So what is this? Okay, let's imagine this is how, what you want guys, maybe in poor condition. So in this case, that existing pavement will be an equivalent granular of, and I said, uh, here, sorry. I say 20 in poor and 30. Granular, right? So uh, 20 in poor condition, I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see. 20 in poor condition is one and a half. 
the factor that I use. And then I have granular. Granular is just one. So 20 is one and a half. And 30 is one. So this is 30. And this one is 30 again. So I have 60. So my equivalent granular uh, thickness is 60 centimeters. I need by frost protection 80. And by structural requirement, I need 62. So frost protection will govern and I need 80. I have 60. So what is the overlay thickness? Eighty minus sixty equals twenty equivalent granular equals divided by two. If I want to do asphalt again, ten centimeters of hot mix asphalt. That's what I'm going to have to provide on this uh, runway. Is this clear? Yes. These are centimeters. I'm going to bring the font size a little down. Okay, so the only thing you need to remember is this is the pavement equivalent granular thickness. From here, you will have to jump into the thickness that you want. In the first case, for instance, we said the 80 from frost protection will govern, right? That was the first question we did today uh, for uh, flexible. And we obtained those conclusions, but we didn't say what was this thickness. We can use cement stabilized base combined with asphalt if you want. Or you can use bituminous stabilized base. or you can go for any of that. There's a long bunch of other specifications, which I'm not really gonna go into. Uh, they are there for the different type of binders, for the base and sub-base aggregates. So I'm gonna show you briefly and quickly. But this is just for your general information that is out there. So uh, this is base and sub-base aggregates requirements, degradation in terms of sieves passing for sub-base and base, for cement stabilized as well. So uh, liquid limit, plasticity index, abrasion lost, okay? So you have all your regular tests. You actually know what is the ASTM test that you will follow for all of this. For the asphalt binder, the penetration grade that you will use for the runways, the aprons, taxiways. This is based on the uh, freezing index on the side. So if it is more than 1,400, Right, I'm just gonna bring them up so to see if it makes sense. So if you are in British Columbia, you're fine. But if you start going in Alberta and probably Edmonton is already in 1,500, you see? Edmonton is probably somewhere in here, somewhere in here. So you are close to 1,750. But if you are in BC, in Vancouver, then you're probably looking at 500. So you have a point of comparison. 
So when you look into the here, if you are looking into the penetration grade that you need to use for the asphalt binder, uh, so for Edmonton and Northern locations, you have to use these uh, values. If you are in Vancouver, you can use these values and most of Canada will be within this range, the 500 to 1,400, okay? Uh, for concrete mix, this is uh, the different test that you will do for the mix, for the concrete, Portland cement we're talking about here now, percentage of voids, the aggregate size, uh, for the aggregates themselves, these are the different tests that you need to respect. Okay, and there's a bunch of these, compaction requirements, the minimum level of compaction that you need to reach on each of the layers, for the base, for the sub-base, subgrade soil, okay, the asphalt concrete. So that's about it for today. I know it's a rather short lecture, uh, although we did not have any break. So I'm going to stop the recording here because otherwise it's very heavy for me to upload into uh, YouTube, but you can ask your questions.